که بیشتر در بیشتر Hi everyone, welcome to Yoga in Canada Summit. Namaste. Today is the International Day of Yoga and you're with us because you're probably someone who loves culture, who loves India, who loves song, dance and everything in between, but also possibly mindfulness. Um, it's 10 years since TGIF, the great Indian festival, the India Fast Festival started. And they started with artists and performances to bring communities closer together because nothing does it better than the art forms. But I think it was a natural progression for them to bring yoga into Canada because India, one of India's greatest gift is probably yoga amongst other things. And I'm a little biased, so that's why I'm saying greatest, but uh, the jury's still out on that one. Um, I'm Karishma, the founder of Soul Katha, and Soul Katha is about connecting deeper into yourself. It's ways to find practices for well-being in finding little positive bits in yourself and the outer world and ways to pay a parent better, ways to have stronger relationships, firstly starting with yourself and then extending out to the community at large. We're here today to honor the International Day of Yoga, to honor yoga in not just an on the mat practice, which is essentially asana. For those of you who weren't with us this morning, I'm just gonna do a little recap of what we did. We had Meghla Desikachar, Mekhala Desikachar and Jyotsna who chanted for us, um, showing us that yoga is more than just asana, it's also a chanting practice. It's also a deep meditation. It's also a therapeutic alliance between a soul. And it was beautiful. You can catch it on YouTube. I'm sure Rupa will help you out with the links. Then we had Saras come on and tell us about natural mind versus yoga mind. What are the tools and techniques one can employ to actually get there. She talks about the different states of mind. Are we even aware of that? And then she moves on to how we can remain in a aware state of mind for you know, more sustainable, sustainable periods of time. And then of course we had Raghu come on to talk about the Yoga Sutra, the ancient text, which is more than 2000 years old and how it is still relevant today, 2000 years later in this modern life, because the human mind really hasn't changed. And psychology remains psychology and it is the best text out there. For me and you, the most important thing to remember is that if it's applicable to your daily life, it makes your life better, then it's still relevant. And that's why Yoga Sutra is so amazing because you can literally take any sutra and apply it to your life to make your life better. Today, this evening, um, and for those of you joining us from other parts of the world at, at night, at midnight, uh, we're gonna be doing chair yoga first. We wanna show you that it's not just about, you know, putting out that yoga mat and doing asana. Yoga is also about movement and breath, and it can be done from bed. It can be done lying down. It can be done standing, it could be done sitting and everything in between, all the different versions can literally be done on your commute on a bus, you know. So yoga has to be suited for the individual to meet your physical needs, to meet your emotional needs, to meet those parts of you that you need more positivity in. After we do a session with beautiful Shana, we're going to, from chair yoga, into a space of heartfulness meditation with Vishwa. He's going to show us how accessing the meditative practices created by the Heartfulness Institute will actually make you feel better. It'll make you less anxious. It'll make you feel more well and more positive to beat every day. After which you have a little parenting 
uh, session with me um, to talk about how the principles and philosophy of yoga can guide you to possibly be a more aware parent. After which, this is the icing on the cake that I have for you. This is not, the, all these things that we've put together for you are not an accident. It has literally been done, strung together with so much love so you can get the very best of what yoga has to offer. I'm not saying that yoga is limited to only these sessions. In fact, it's bigger, broader, wider, happier than just this. But it's been put together for you to show you, to give you a little tasting that yoga is much more than what is available or thought of. So we're going to end with yoga nidra where we'll give you instructions as to how to grab your pillow and how to make you really, really comfortable. And this entire summit is going to end on a silent note with you becoming closer to yourself and hopefully finding the yoga part of you. And that's the sensation I want you to carry with you in the days to come, in the months to come, where you come back for more, you come back to the yoga in Canada summit more, you come back to Solkatha and all the speakers and panelists and everyone who does yoga in a more mindful way, in a space of service, where we reduce our dukkham, where we reduce our suffering and bring in more positivity, more happiness into our lives. I'm really, really honored to have His Excellency Ajay Bisarya, the High Commissioner of India to Canada here. He's also a patron of the Great India Festival. It's such a pleasure to have people who continue to support Indian culture, who continue to vibrate with the frequency of being mindful of what India really has to offer. And we welcome him now into the spotlight to light the lamp for us. Namaskar. So I start with lighting the lamp without any further ado. The lamp is lit and as we say uh, in the ancient uh, Indian custom, Jyotirgamaya uh, 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 to take us from darkness to light and that is the whole purpose of taking us uh, to a better spot and uh, to a more auspicious start to this wonderful event. So here's the lamp and here it is lit uh, to spread the light. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, uh, I like this. Um, yeah. Thank you for uh, having me as part of this. Uh, very good morning uh, and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's so wonderful that we uh, get together to celebrate uh, the International Day of Yoga. Today is the longest day of the year, and today is the auspicious day of uh, the International uh, Day of Yoga. This is the seventh time that we would be celebrating uh, this event ever since the United Nations declared the 21st of June as the International Day of Yoga. It's, yoga is really India's gift to humanity. It is a gift of the ancient Indian tradition and updated by modern science and updated by modern learning. Uh, so we've been talking about uh, in this pandemic times, what India has brought uh, to the world. India has been the pharmacy of the world. India has been the vaccine maker of the world. But India is in many ways also the healer of the world because the ancient uh, systems of Ayurveda and yoga updated with modern science are also India's gifts to the world. This, this is the second time we would be celebrating uh, International Day of Yoga from home, uh, given uh, the challenges of the pandemic. But what we see is that the fervor, the energy has not reduced. And I've been watching these events uh, uh, last couple of days. Uh, we feel so interconnected as a globe if you see the number of events being held uh, in different parts of the world. 
uh, we uh, even in Canada yesterday we had a wonderful event outside of uh, Canada's Parliament and with parliamentarians I had the pleasure to join them and uh, we said that we need this special energy uh, in Parliament where we have tough debates both before the debates and uh, to have more peaceful debates and after them to relax from them. So uh, yoga is uh, the unity of the mind, body, soul in pandemic times even more relevant because yoga is after all an inner journey. It's a journey within ourselves and uh, with uh, yoga we learn the techniques for making that inner journey to achieve those inner goals. And uh, it's so wonderful uh, that the Great India Festival is doing the Great Yoga Festival, the India-Canada Summit. I think uh, it is an appropriate moment uh, to be doing it, the right time to be launching it. So I want to wish you uh, all success for this event. Uh, your agenda today seems just the right one. It seems just the powerful one to give us uh, the kind of uh, inner peace uh, that we look for. But all success to you for uh, this event and all the events coming up uh, related to yoga uh, in the next few days. So thank you very much for having me. Namaskar. Thank you so much, Ajay Ri. Namaste. Uh, as we say, uh, we're going to also welcome uh, Dr. Srinivas Kanhari to please light the lamp. Dr. Srinivas Kanhari has been a huge proponent of the yoga in Canada movement. He's been doing yoga for the last 30 years and it is he's one of the founding fathers of this movement so to speak so we're very very honored for him to be here with us and to light the lamp and move us again from darkness to light as as mr basaria just said Thank you so Thank you much, much for uh, asking me to light the lamp. And uh, as we say in the yoga that it's, uh, it's for the development of all the aspects of life in uh, each and every person. And uh, it refers to the all the bodies uh, within us, starting with the Annamai Sharira, which is the body created by food, Pranamai Sharira, Anandamai Sharira, and Manomai Sharira. So it deals with all the aspects of the body, all the aspects of the mind, all the aspects of uh, spiritual aspects of life. And that is what yoga is. Yoga is, its definition is, comes from the Sanskrit word yuja, to join. To join the self with the eternal self, jiva with paramatma. So that is the very essence of yoga. And we do that in every aspect of life. Thank you. Really beautifully said, Mr. Kanavi. Thank you. I think that we are trying to do that today. For those of you just joining us, we are in the Yoga in Canada Summit. Today is the International Day of Yoga and we are celebrating the Great India Festival and Soul Katha with bringing together practices from various panelists from across the world, whether it's Canada, India, um, America, people are joining us. And of course, Indians in Canada and you know, Americans all over the world. <laughs> it's, it's, it is a space of mindfulness. This is a space where people to come together because yoga right now, it probably originated from India, but literally takes ownership in many homes across the world. It's a universal language that sort of binds us all. And I think we uh, have sort of have to bow out humbly and say that it doesn't belong to us anymore in that sense that it belongs to anyone else because it, goes across, you know, religion, race, color. It is a language that everyone understands. And I think that's why people are gathered here to, 
to heal themselves, to find the answers for who I, for what you are, why you are, and how you can make it, make yourself more vibrant. So I think that um, it would be really nice for those of you with us to grab a chair because we're going to be sitting with Shanna and we're going to be moving and breathing. I'm going to start with first bringing Shana on. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Visaria and Mr. Kanari. Thank you for being with us. And welcome. if we can welcome Shana and have her here, I'd like to introduce Shana. Shana is really, really special because I think she's one of those people who actually cuts across the, the, the universality that I was talking about. She spent the first 15 years of her life in Kashmir and has actually been exposed to uh, the Shivaism, the, the roots of the Himalayas where it actually began. And she's then moved back to, to America when she was 15 and continued with her yoga practice. She has, hey Shara, good to see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, so just to walk, I'm just walking people down your beautiful story of growing up in the foothills or in the Himalayas, yes. um, and exploring yoga through your parents, through your, through this, through the Swami, Lakshmi Ju, and then coming back to India and really immersing yourself in yoga therapy, which is one-on-one, -on -one, right. un understanding of a client, the journey between understanding their health from a mental perspective, from a physical perspective, from a, phys a spiritual perspective. And something that Shana says, which I also resonate with, is a lot of people get put off by yoga because they think that, you know, it doesn't suit them. They think that yoga uh, isn't meant for them because this is so hard, or they've been pushed so hard when they walk into a studio and they, you know, you get that shoulder issues, you get lower back issues and they get put off by yoga. But as my teachers have said to me, yoga is, has to be made to fit the individual and not the other way around. And I think that's exactly what Shana is going to prove to us as you do chair yoga. So I'm so very honored because she spent her entire life, she travels around the globe, you know, journeying with people and explaining to them that yoga is not about just the tough asanas. It's not about the lotus pose and you know being able to go upside down, but it's a mindfulness activity. She's helped people heal emotional raw wounds, physical gaps in themselves through this very practice. Uh, welcome, Shana. It's so lovely to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank you. Nice to have. Nice to be here, Karishma. This is an honor. So thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, <laughs> of, of, of some questions before you actually lead us through the practice. Right. If you'd like to instruct people, because we're going to start the practice in about 15 minutes. So if you'd like to instruct people to set up their home to, to do this. I would just, I would just say, find a chair that's comfortable, find a chair that's supportive, find a chair where your feet are on the ground. <laughs> that's what's <laughs> important, right? And however your chair is, a cushion behind the back is fine, cushion underneath your feet, like all that matters, as Karishma was saying, is where you feel supported and comfortable. It's not about how it looks, it's more about how it feels. And something of what Karishma said that just really stood out for me is that as a child, when I was raised in Kashmir, um, out near Nishat and Shalimar Bagh, you know, where all my friends were Kashmiri, we spoke Hindi and Urdu and Kashmiri, is I remember my whole childhood until I came to America, <laughs> I never knew that yoga was asana because I was raised with my parents being meditation teachers. And so I always thought that yoga was connecting to your true self, you know, connecting to your true nature and meditating. And then when I came to America in the 80s, and there was a little bit of yoga asana here in town, I remember thinking, is this the American? Like, what, what, is, what is this? I had no idea. Because in Kashmir Shaivism that I was raised in, that my father's published 11 books until now, we have another 17 to go, it was never um, really talked about. 
in Kashmir compared to other parts of India now that I've learned, right? And so, yeah, so I just, I wanted to add that piece of what you had mentioned because I, I find that so interesting. And now for so many people here in the West is just asana and they're missing out on the power of breath and the power of just being still for a while. So um, please continue, Karishma. I just wanted to throw that in. No, that's just beautiful, Shana. I really wanted to hear that little piece about what you had to say about yourself. Right. Because I think that leads very well into a little um, bhajan that mm. a beautiful Urvika Agarwal has put together for us yeah. for this event. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna just quickly introduce Urvika. Urvika has actually started something called the Indian Rhythms where she teaches children about Indian song and she's actually bridged the gap for Indian kids in Ottawa to uh, you know, allow them that access to Indian music and still feel connected to their roots back home. She's also a volunteer. And Namaste. Lord Ganesha is well known as Vignaharta or the Removal Obstacle. We invoke Lord Ganesha in the beginning of all new events. He has big elephant head with big ears and a very large tummy. The elephant head is an indication of knowledge and wisdom. The big ears signifies that he listens to everything patiently and his big tummy is to peacefully digest all good and bad in the world. According to yogic belief, Lord Ganesha is the Lord of Muldhara Chakra responsible for the energy and consciousness within us. We sing and pray to him so that wisdom can awaken within us. I will be presenting a Ganesh Mantra followed by a Ganesh Aarti. Thank you, the Great India Festival, for giving me this opportunity to invoke Lord Ganesha in our Yoga Summit today. I hope you enjoy this offering.
I can't hear you. <laughs> Hi. There you are. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Arubita. It was actually Arubita's first performance, her first debut performance. We're so grateful that she's doing it for the Yoga International Day and TGIF. Um, she's actually a volunteer with the local um, Ottawa Hospital, and she helps with mental health issues. She helps with well-being. And I think that, you know, the service oriented, the sadhana practice that she does for people in her community, the different volunteering initiative that she does shows through in her voice, in her vibration. So it's the perfect way to sort of come back into your session, Shana, because I think everyone's senses have been awakened. <laughs> mm, no, it's just wonderful. Even since a child, I've had this Ganesh around my neck. And Ganesh was my favorite because as a child, it's so relate he's so relatable right in so many different ways and you read all the amar chitra katha comics and then you're just taken away with everything so thank you arubita yeah so would you like us to do a practice do you have any let me let me do a little bit let me do a little bit of background about chair yoga if i may is that okay please okay so i just wanted to mention for those of you who are going to be joining with this practice is that what I've learned being a yoga therapist and um, sharing yoga um, at the college level, level as a professor, so I work with young people in their early 20s, and working with a back doctor who sends me patients with um, lower back pain and neck pain and all these different things. And then I also work at the senior center here in Culver City, where I work with people 60, 70, 80, 100. I have a, uh, one of our students is 102. And so I'm working with such a wide array of types of people or abilities, right? And what I've learned again and again and again is that as Karishma had said earlier, that the practice of yoga is so individual. And so for me to say you have these 26 poses and you need to be doing these 26 poses and one of them is a headstand, I'm going to hurt somebody. And so I come into this practice 
sharing these ancient teachings so that a person can use these teachings to heal themselves. I have nothing to do with that. I'm just sharing, as my mom always used to tell me, Shana, it's not you. It's the teachings and the ancient teachings of the great masters that are passing through and that you're sharing the little bit that you know. And so with that in mind, as a yoga therapist, I share these teachings. And what I've learned is from my college students, they get hurt, right? They get injured. I, I, I work with a lot of our athletes at our university. They get injured. And so they can't do a regular asana practice. So they'll do the group practice with my group wearing, um, I mean, in, in a chair, so they'll still be able to stretch their upper body. They'll still be able to stretch their legs and they'll still be able to do some movement in their back because the more we don't move physically, the more our body becomes rigid. And the same thing with the mind, the more we allow ourselves not to use it more, but to be still more, the mind becomes clear. So that's my one set of students that I work with. And then the second is with, um, that the doctor sends me his patients that have many different types of back issues. For most of them, they can't do a regular asana practice. There's no way. So I do a lot of chair and then we record it and then they take it home and they do the practice. And then the final part, which is my most favorite class or it used to be before COVID started <laughs> is, is working at the senior center and working with my seniors where we have between 15 to 40 students that join from the ages of 60, as I said, above 90. And we all used to come together and all we would do is just, we would, we would start off with a little breath. We'd go into different types of movement, which I'm gonna do here. We're gonna, I'm gonna share a bit of it. And then we would sit and we'd do a pranayama for those of you who speak English only. We do some sort of breathing practice, right? And then we do just a little five minute meditation. This is like midpoint. And then we go into some more like seated asana. Sometimes we'd stand, not always. A lot of times we wouldn't even do any standing practices, all seated, especially because some of my students would be in wheelchairs. And then the last part was we do another pranayama, some sort of breathing practice, let me repeat, <laughs> and then a nice long relaxation. And then they'd go feeling lighter of body, but not of just body. The, the main thing I would say is of heart and of mind. And that's what they would take with them, right? And so, um, yeah, it's, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. It just depends on what you're needing. Like sometimes if I'm sitting on this Zoom thing for too long, I'll just do some little movements right in my chair, but I'm going to be able to show you my full body in the other camera when we go to do the practice. So Karishma, any questions before we do a practice together? Um, so the, everything that you, you're talking about here, Shana, is that it's not a lesser than practice. This is not a cheat sheet. This is not, oh, I'm being lazy or I can't move sort of practice. This is actually something that would help, right? I feel better. All the people I worked with feel better. And it's not me. It's the, the, the asana and the movement and the breath that they're doing. So no, there's no, I think there's no such thing as cheating. It's just doing what feels best for ourselves. And some days I need more and some days I need less. And that's probably all of you, right? It just depends. And so the more we can get some sort of movement, the more we can get some sort of breath moving and get everything moving within us, the healthier and the better, right? For the mind and the body. So yes, no cheating. No cheating. And this could be, and I find that I do chair yoga, but, and even on the days when I can actually get on the mat and do a, what they call more classical asana, yeah. chair yoga serves me better some days, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and it's individualized to the way I feel in that moment. My yoga practice is individualized. It keeps flowing with what I need. Right. But, and, and that's fine because, you know, as practitioners of yoga, we can curate our own practices. Could you share a story of a client or someone you've worked with where you've, you know, you've given them these practices? Uh, could you tell us, walk us through that journey? You know, the one that comes to my mind, her name is Anne. She's no longer here. And um, she was one of my first clients many, many years ago. She was 94 years old. She had, um, she had, um, she was a survivor of the Auschwitz. Um, her whole family had been um, killed pretty much during the, the whole, you know, World War II. And so she was a survivor. So she 
talk about those stories much. She was so clear of mind. Her body was becoming a little more unstable, right? And so with her, I started working with her and seeing her twice a week. I would go to her house. And the reason I even started chair yoga, I wasn't really taught it in the yoga therapy program. I did the three-year program was that me and her caretaker, we were going to do asana. So she's like, oh, I want to get on the ground. I was like, okay, get on the ground. We'll get you down. What happened is once she got on the ground, she wasn't able to get up. So we had to like pull her up and pick her up and pull her. And it was really intense on her and on us because she was dead weight. So after that, I went home and I started creating small little practices that I had learned from my you know, gentle yoga asana practice on the mat. How could I bring that on into the chair version? And so we started doing it together. And what was beautiful about her is she was so open to anything. So we just started as a joyful practice. So we started bringing in different movements and I'll go over the basic ones when we do a practice and we started doing the pranayama and her caretaker would do these breathing practices with her every day, right? We had a little audio that we recorded. That's the beauty of technology. Technology is a, not a good thing in some ways, but in some ways it's so wonderful. So they do a breathing practice every morning. They do a breathing practice every evening. They'd get about 15 minutes, only 15 minutes of movement in every day. And then I would see them twice a week and we do 45 minutes at the other times. And, um, you know, I just, even her caretaker mentioned that she was just becoming, she felt stronger. She sat up taller. She became a little bit even clearer of mind than she already was. She was able to walk with more ease. And so it was just really exhilarating where I was like, ah, oh, this is it. Because before that, I had never even done it before. And so we continued. And then over time, um, she left her body right? It's part of the process. But, um, but, but that was where I really got into a nice saw from practicing twice a week, as well as she was diligent about doing it on her own with her caretaker. I started noticing the changes and it was fabulous because she noticed, forget about me. She noticed a difference, right? So yeah, so that's one of the, one of the many. That's just beautiful, Shana, because you actually innovated it on the go for right. her to meet her needs. Yeah. I can feel that you're itching to sort of lead us through the practice. And yeah. I think that everyone here can't wait either. We, huh. You know, yoga is about doing, right? It's about the experimental immersion of it. So right. please, whenever you're ready. Okay. So I'm gonna us. change, I'm gonna change, give me half a minute. Those of you who have joined um, just now or whatever it is, make sure you have a chair. That's all you need, okay? And let me just change camera. So give me a minute to go sit over where we're gonna be. Okay, good. Oh. So let's see, I'm going over to Logitech Brio. Okay, there it is, but I don't want that background. Hold on, just give me a moment. <laughs> and we're gonna be right there. So none. Alrighty. So let me put in the big one. Get so used to doing the Zoom things, right? Mm -hmm. so everyone, I'm getting it together. Now I gotta put the green screen down and there we are, okay. Fantastic. All righty. So, yeah, there we are. Good. Can you see me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, everyone, <laughs> welcome to this practice. We're going to practice together for about 18 minutes. That's mm -hmm. what we have. So, what I would like you to do is I would like you to find a chair where your feet are either flat on the ground, and if they're hanging, Put something underneath because you need that support for your back. Bring your hands on your thighs, spread your fingers, raise all 10 of your toes and spread the toes and start to find that length in your spine. Let the shoulders spread and come down and then let the toes soften, let the fingers soften. And I just want you to settle in, just settling in. Feeling that connection of the earth surface, the connection, the tactile sensation of the hands and your thighs. Maybe even a touch of the air on your skin. And I want you to start to just observe and notice how you were feeling at this moment physically. Scan through your body, check in. And I want you to keep in mind with any of these basic movements that we're going to be doing, if something doesn't feel good, don't do it. <laughs> okay. 
And now I want you to check in with your mind. How's your mind today? As in, what are the thoughts that are repeating today as you came to join this wonderful program on Zoom? Like, where was your state of mind? Open, a little closed, a little foggy, fresh, certain thoughts that are repetitive according to whatever's going on in your life. Just observe, becoming your own observer. And then go a little bit deeper and start to notice your breath. Observe your breath. Notice your breath that is moving in and out of you. And if possible, unless you are congested, notice your breath as it moves in and out of your nostrils. Noticing the inhale. Noticing the exhale. Just observe this breath because where you bring attention to there, the healing happens. So as you begin to observe your breath, you also can then start to lengthen it. Now through this practice, let the breath be your guide, not the movement, but the breath. And bring your hands to your heart center, settling in touching thumbs to heart, palms slightly open. And what we're going to be focusing on here first is the four different movements of the spine for the first like five minutes or so. So come along as we go in and out of these different movements. So as you inhale, bring your hands slowly up to the sky, not fully, just to the extent that feels okay. And then as you exhale, pull the hands to your heart. And as you inhale, spread the arms out, lift the chest slightly, okay? And as you exhale, start to curve over as if you're curving over an ancient tree trunk, hanging on out. And then inhale, roll up, sit up tall. And then exhale, pull the hands to the heart, bow down. Just like that, two more rounds. Inhale, bring the hands up to the sky. You can look up or look forward. What is your neck like today? Exhale, pull your hands to your heart with the breath. Inhale, open the arms, lift the chest. And then exhale, curve over a tree trunk. Let the chin come to the chest. Inhale, roll up, sit up tall. And then exhale, pull in to the center. One more like that. Inhale, sky. Exhale, heart. Inhale, spread open, lift the chest. Exhale, curve over chin to chest. Inhale, roll up, sit up. Exhale, hands to the heart center. Okay. So we got the arching of the spine and the curving of the spine. Now let's do the lateral bending. So bring the right leg out, and that might just be a little bit, or I'm mirroring you, right? <laughs> bring the right leg out further, whatever feels comfortable. Make sure that left knee that's bent is going through the center of your left foot, and the left, sorry, the right hand is on the right thigh. Let the left arm hang. Sit up tall. And as you inhale, sweep that left arm up. And as you exhale, slide that right hand down the right arm, I mean right leg, and let the left arm come over the head. And then inhale, lift up. So we go in and out of these movements about three times, just warming up the areas as well as linking the breath. Exhale, slide the right hand down, bring the arm over the ear. And inhale, lift up and open. And next one, we're going to hold. Exhale, over, hold and breathe. Bend the left elbow. Turn the head, look down at the right foot. Keep that left foot rooted. How's your breath here? And then inhale, lift that left arm, lift it up, lift it up, touch the sky. And exhale, let the left hand come down. Bring the left hand behind you, hold on to the chair behind you. Bring the right hand to the left thigh. Sit up, starting from your lower abdomen, take an inhale here as in this twist movement, and then exhale, twist to the left, and then the chest moves, and then the head over the shoulder. And then inhale, untwist, facing forward. Again, exhale, sit up tall, twist to the left, lower belly, chest, 
head over the shoulder last, ever so lightly. Inhale, untwist. And one more exhale, twist to the left and hold and breathe. Allow both of your shoulders to soften away from your ears. Come to your breath here as an observe the natural free-flowing movement of your breath in and out of you. And as you inhale, inhale here. And exhale, untwist. So this is a perfect opportunity. We have the legs the way they are to bend the left elbow, bring the left forearm on the left thigh and let the left palm be open and available and alive like a cup. And let the right arm just hang in between your legs. And as you inhale, sweep that right arm up to the sky. And then exhale, sweep that right arm forward and down between the legs. Again, with the breath, inhale, sweep forward, lift up and open, either partly or all the way. And exhale, right arm out and forward and down. Next one we're going to hold. Inhale, sweep that right arm up. Now, for some people, this is not going to feel good. Then maybe bend the right elbow. Or for some people, that might not be good either. So then just have the right hand on the hip. So it's more of an opening of the chest. And instead of just automatically looking up every time your arm is up, look down sometimes. And if it's available and feels good, then look up. But don't make it a habit of just always looking up, right? Now let that right arm be up if it is up. And inhale, get lifted up, spread out, spread the arms out. And then bring the hands together as the right foot comes next to the left foot, hands to the heart center. Become still for a couple breaths without doing anything. This is where the feedback happens. Allowing the whole right side to settle. Let the arms come down. And let's go to the other side. So let the left leg come out to the side. That might be a little or a lot again. Let the left hand come to the left thigh. Sit up. And as you inhale, sweep your right arm out and up. And as you exhale, slide the left hand down the thigh as the right arm comes over the ear. Bend the right elbow. Inhale, lift up. And exhale, slide down and come over. Again, with the breath guiding you, Inhale, lift up and open. And exhale, slide down, arm over the ear. Turn your head, look down. Allow that right sit bone to press into the seat of your chair. And then you can choose to look forward if you like. You can choose to open the arm. You can choose to bring the hand to the hip. Right, Modifying is not a weakness. To me, modifying and doing what your body needs today is a strength because in your listening to the voice within you, as you inhale, get lifted up. And as you exhale, bring the right hand behind you. Hold on to the back of the chair. Bring the left hand to the right thigh. Sit up tall. Inhale, lengthen the spine. Exhale, twist to the right. Inhale, untwist. And exhale, twist to the right. One more inhale, untwist. And again, exhale, sitting up tall, twist bit by bit, and then hold. And now notice the difference between the two sides. Well, one side usually feels a little easier, a little smoother. It all depends on where we've been injured, where we're tight, what side of our body we sleep on how we lean when we sit in our car, causes all these imbalances physically. So just balancing it out through this practice. Inhale, untwist. And now bend that right elbow. Let the right forearm come down on the right thigh. Let the left arm hang between your legs. Okay. And as you inhale, sweep that left arm up. And exhale, left arm forward and down. Again, with the breath, inhale, sweep up and open. You can even follow the hand and arm as it goes up and down. Exhale, down. Next one, let's hold. Inhale, lift up. Hold and breathe. 
Keep the arms stretched up or as you, as I mentioned earlier, bend the left elbow, hand on the head or left hand on the hip. What feels best? That's always the big clue. What's feeling good today? One more breath here. And as you inhale, lift up, spread out. And as you exhale, bring the arms down. Let the left foot come next to the right foot. Stay here first for a couple of breaths. And let's just do one more piece that has to do with legs because we haven't done much of legs. We did a little bit of opening the legs. Let's do just one piece with legs. It's a nice little vinyasa, a little nice well thought out steps. So let the arms hang. And I'll go slow. <laughs> Inhale, sweep your arms forward and up. And exhale, bring your right knee into your chest, hands underneath your right thigh. And then inhale, open the right knee out to the side, left arm out to the other side. And then exhale, pull it all in, hands underneath your right thigh. Inhale, straighten your right leg, press the heel forward, toes to the face. And exhale, bend the right knee, arms down. Just like that on the left side. Inhale, sweep forward and up. This brings in hip opening, hamstrings. Exhale, left knee into the chest. Inhale, left knee out to the side, right arm to the other side. Exhale, pull in, hands underneath the thigh. Inhale, straighten the left leg, press the heel forward. And exhale, foot down, arms down. So let's just do that one more on each side. Inhale, sweep forward and up. Exhale, pull the right knee in. Inhale, open the right knee, left arm out. Exhale, pull into midline, hands under the right thigh. Inhale, straighten, open the toes, press the heel forward. Exhale, right foot forward and down, arms down. Inhale, seat forward and up. Exhale, left knee in. Inhale, left knee out to the side, right arm to the other. Exhale, pull into center. Inhale, straighten, press forward, heel forward, toes open. Exhale, left knee down or left foot down, hands on the thighs. Now with me, take a full, full inhale through the nose. And out of the mouth, exhale, let it go. Good. We have a few minutes left here and of my understanding that yes, the movement's so important and yes, the breath part of that's so important. But if you don't bring in as, as Karishma said, a little dessert, which is some breath work, then what is it? It's just exercise, huh? So let's end here. One of my favorite, I, I take um, yoga teachers and yoga therapists to Pondicherry, or I used to before COVID from our university, um, to one of the main state-run hospitals where they have a yoga therapy ward there. And what they use for people with any type of anxiety and stresses and worries and depression again and again is the humming bee, right? The brahmari. So we're going to do that together. I know sometimes it's done with the eyes covered, ears covered and all that, but today let's just do a basic one. So hands on the thighs and how this works for any of you that are new to this is you'll be inhaling fully and you'll be exhaling as long as you can with the sound of M. So it's hmm. so like a humming bee, huh? But you're only one. When you're in a classroom of a bunch of people humming bees, then it's like a, a, a beehive. It's just wonderful. And so sit up tall, hands on the thighs. We'll do this just for about a minute or a minute and a half. Take a full, full inhale here. And begin exhaling. Keep on going.
Now let your breath be free. Let it move in and out of you naturally without any work. Just sit here and observe your natural free-flowing movement of your breath. Noticing the inhale, noticing the exhale. And bring your hands to your heart center and Anjali Mudra. As you bow your head, as you send in healing first, connecting to your wholeness, sending out healing to those in need. And as you lift your head and as you open your eyes, we bow down to each other with a namaste. So to each of you, thank you. Good. So perfect timing, right, Karishma? Karishma, it's three o'clock. Yay, I did it. <laughs> perfect timing, perfect practice, perfect Great. message, Shana. Wonderful. I think that for everyone who did this, I did the practice and I just literally feel my whole body opening up and I feel okay. centered. I feel good. Good. And I think that the message here for everyone watching is modifying to suit your body is a strength. It's not a weakness. Doing chair yoga is for the fit and healthy. But more than that, yoga, we always say, ahimsa, non-violence to the self, always comes before anything else. Yeah. Um, and I think that's exactly what Shana showed you just now. I love the narrative. I love the way you use the body to, you know, to hold us like a cup and a tree. And there were so many... Uh, beautiful little ways that you held us through those movements, Shana. It's just stunningly beautiful. I'm so very grateful for you to take the time. Thank you. This is wonderful. So thank you so much. And, and I'll be joining as the day progresses. I have something right now, but I'll be back. And, and, and thank you. This is lovely thank and honor. So, so thank you, Karishma. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Namaskar. Bye. <laughs> um, um, hi, everyone who's watching. Thank you so much for being with us. We're going to continue on with the International Day of Yoga, Yoga in Canada Summit. We're going to be doing two more sessions, one on yoga parenting. And the last one, we'll end with a really nice sweet spot, which is Yoga Nidra. Um, I'd like to welcome Siddharth Inamdar. Uh, hi. Uh, Siddharth is a group product manager at Keyside Technologies, is it? Yep. Okay, I got that right. I've only known Inamda for, I think, 30, 32, 33 years. And I had to ask him yesterday where he works. And I had to remember it. <laughs> so it was a real effort there. Uh, I'm going to, Inamda is also the father of two very, very beautiful children. He lives in Colorado. Um, and we're old friends from school. And I, the rest, I leave up to him to, you know, guide us through this. Okay, thanks, Karish, and thanks for inviting me to do this. Uh, I was only able to catch the last 10 minutes, but it looks like a, a really, really awesome conference. I wish I could have uh, joined a little earlier to see what, uh, you know, what, what the whole conference was about. Um, so um, I think what I like to do is uh, just, just talk to you informally about uh, yoga parenting, as um, yeah, as as you are the uh, author and and uh, innovator of yoga parenting, if you will, um, maybe uh, let me let me start off with a uh, an introduction to to Karish, as uh, as I, I believe she's been emceeing the entire uh, seminar or conference, and uh, I, I assume most haven't gotten a, a background on uh, on her. So a very quick intro is. Uh, Karish is the founder of Soul Kata and Yoga Parent. She's been a practitioner of yoga, well-being, and conscious parenting for the last 10 years, training with healers, teachers, and therapists from all over the world. 
As a conscious parenting coach, he uses the principles and philosophy of yoga to guide parents into a thriving parent-child relationship. And she believes that a parent can feel truly enriching and, and be an empowering experience when you learn the right skills and frameworks. Is that, is that about sum it up right, Karish? I think so, yes. Good okay. job. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's let's just dive into uh, into yoga parenting and and, uh, and just talk through it. And I'll be I'll be monitoring the, uh, uh, the the chat window. And great first question: What is yoga parenting? Because the first time I learned about yoga parenting from you, I got images of stretchy pants and impossible moves, which I'm not able to do. So maybe let's start off with: What is <laughs> yoga parenting? Yeah, so that's a great question to everyone who's watching. You're not a failed parent if you can't stretch. Um, and you could definitely fit into the yoga parenting literally because you're watching. That That's all that matters. The only category of being a yoga parent is to be interested in parenting. So what yoga parent is to me is the kind of person who seeks to understand, to learn, is curious about better parenting. And the reason I'm putting yoga, and I know that yoga is a word that's so... Uh, is used so much. Someone on the session was actually talking about how they have a yoga beer now. And uh, and the person was quite aghast at the concept. We have a yoga computer. And now to say yoga parents, some of my clients were like, can we not call this a yoga parent because yoga is you know such an overstretched word. But to me, it's a deeply personal thing. Because for me, yoga has helped me raise my children better. It's because of the tools and techniques and practices that I have applied in my life to yoga, that mindfulness, that consciousness has helped me parent better. And that helps me guide other parents to parent better. So this exact image that you have in Amda of parents like in stretchy pants or trying to do impossible moves is exactly the misnomer that yoga is about. We just did a chair yoga session. We talked about yoga as and uh, as a state of mind, we've talked about the Yoga Sutra and how we can apply that in this summit. And I think that yoga is bigger, broader, and better than these, you know, this airtight definition that the Western world has given it when we exported it, you know, a few decades ago. Yoga is a state of being, it's a state of awareness, and you can parent with that. I think, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, that does answer the question, and and maybe if we can go into a little bit about uh, folks on on the on the phone or on the conference might be more familiar with some of the principles and philosophies behind the traditional yoga yoga methodologies. Maybe if you could draw some parallels between the yoga principles and philosophies, the yoga parent, you know, that might help solidify why 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 you chose to call it yoga parent. Right, so that is actually a lifetime of study and explanation, but I try my best to do justice to that question. The principle of yoga is to have a positive sense of well-being, is to have a deeper connection with yourself. And that deeper connection, that vibration that I find within myself, I spread towards my community. But I, that starts at home. That starts with my spouse or my mom or my partner or my children, right? So when I apply the principle of non-violence to myself, ahimsa, satya, truth, I take on those principles of yoga and I begin that with myself. And then I spread that to my children. So in an overarching way, yoga is helping me connect better to myself through the practices of visualization, through the practices of, of emotional awareness, through the practices of understanding my different states of mind, through the practice of understanding what is triggering me in my environment. When my child says, you're so mean, right? I get triggered, but is it me, like the person, or is it somebody else? Or is it me, you know, what is it in my conditioning, in my samskara, in my patterns of thinking that triggers me? Or is it just her or him being in that moment, right? And just expressing themselves and 
what would be the more mindful the more yoga way to understand that reaction so my child is saying you are mean and there's so many different ways i can do it I'm like i'm not being mean you're being mean you're always on my case or i can say yeah yeah that's fine for you i'm a, i'm always a villain and i can let it go or i could say all right thank you for sharing your feelings with me or i could smile and laugh it off and not even respond and in a deep level i can feel the calm vibration going through me so the philosophy extends into the daily application of my life which is can i stay present and calm in myself through my parenting moments through my parenting journey and i think that everybody who's ever become a parent knows that we are birthed as parents when the child is born we've never done this before we've had no skills at all right it's not like everyone had to go to parenting school before we got into this journey and life just changes boom and then we become a parent and we're sort of we don't know what to do and we just do the best we can and we're always in survival mode if we had a framework if we had principles as to what to guide us how to manage our emotions how to manage our self image so much about parenting is about putting our self image on children and saying they have to be versions of success that we think of in our head they have to be versions or images of being polite and respectful or they have to be a great singer or to do well in school whatever it is that we have in our conditioning we pass down and the principle the philosophy of yoga is to reduce the samskara is to reduce that consciousness from one generation to the next to the next so when i am really aware of what i am and who i am from a very deep yogic place which i am not there yet right so big disclaimer i am not there yet i'm just figuring this out <laughs> is i there are more aware and present to my child's needs and those principle that philosophy is the overarching guidance it's like a compass for me to parent better so maybe maybe in the last uh, the last question to to solidify what is yoga parenting because it's a new it's a new phrase for a lot of people what what is what does it mean not to be a yoga parent what what is not being a yoga parent look like to you were you not a yoga parent at some point in your life uh, which made you move towards being a yoga parent uh, can you talk about that a little bit i don't know what it doesn't mean to be a yoga parent i think it's too pedantic and um there is there's so many ways to be a good parent without sort of even applying yoga or even knowing about yoga so i wouldn't say that if you haven't been exposed to this this is you know you're probably not a yoga parent and so many people are doing positive parenting gentle parenting respectful parenting without applying the philosophy of yoga and it would come under the larger umbrella of yoga but they probably don't even know it so it's a definition that i have found very useful in my life but i don't think that you know everyone has to be a yoga parent or yoga is something that defines you and i don't want to be pedantic life is about being open and being in the flow and finding what resonates for you and your child and if yoga parent resonates with you if that vibration matches you great otherwise find the next best thing you know there's so many ways you can do tai chi you can do dance there's so many ways to find union with yourself yoga is one and within yoga there are thousand different ways but so i'm not a proponent of saying this is the only thing but what not being mindful not being respectful of your child means that your child grows up with hidden traumas with lack of confidence with a a sense of self that is betraying the very essence of being human or being awakened in themselves when you respect your child and treat them as one with you and you protect them with the safety that they need then you are really being present to their needs and you're being a yoga parent so i don't know what not a yoga parent is but i do know that this is what a yoga parent could be and to be honest i was uh, i think i've been doing yoga for about 7 8 years in a very deep way 
uh, for about six hours, seven hours a day. That's all I was doing from chanting to meditation, to asana, to volunteering, to everything. So by the time the kids came along, and thank you for that, um, I was, I didn't know that I was already doing yoga parenting. In fact, it's a word that came to me only recently because I was like, I'm doing something different. People are telling me I'm doing something different. I know I'm doing something different because I go to a party and I can see how other parents are parenting. And I'm like, something's odd here. Something's different here. And you know, it's a typical birthday party. There are 40 kids there and so many parents present. And the way that they treat their children is very different from the way I treat my children. And, and that's how the words sort of came about, the yoga parent word. So no, I don't think that I have never not, I don't think I've ever not yoga parented, but at the same time, I'm learning every single day. I get, I'm working on my triggers. I'm working on what, what new stimuli my children give me. I'm learning with them. I'm growing with them every single day. And they teach me because I believe that it, parenting should be child-led. So they teach me how to parent. And I think that is yoga. Staying curious, staying open, constantly learning. I think that is yoga. And so, yes, in that regard, I'm always, always learning. And I'm, that, I'm a yoga parent. So a lot of what you described, uh, I, I sort of reflecting back on my own meditation practice, and, and it brings about uh, the thought I had when, when you were speaking is, um, you know, extending your state of presence while meditating to the act of parenting. Is, is that along the lines of yoga parenting, or is it is it beyond being mindful of, of your parenting practices to something broader than that? So absolutely, both statements I resonate with. That meditation practice that you do for yourself and when, you, when that meditation extends into your day, into your parenting moments, the image when you said that I got was, I remember when we were living in uh, Sydney, uh, my, my daughter was six months old. She just began to crawl. And for the longest time, she used to just, you know, obviously she's exploring everything. She used to spend 15, 20, 40 minutes exploring and touching each single object in the house. And my idea of parenting was watching, witnessing, wondering, and being in awe of the way she was exploring, right? And that is meditation for me, that me watching my child, I do that even today. I'm constantly awestruck by their answers. I'm constantly in wonder of how their mind works because they take us to places where we can't go because their mind is so open, their neurobiology is so subtle, they're, the way that they see the world is so different from, because they're not conditioned like us. The, the patterns and the set thinking is not as tuned and set in set boxes as ours. So she leads me there and she takes me into meditation. He brings me to new perspectives. You know, the other day we were lying in bed and my son asked me, why aren't there, why don't uh, beds have hands? Why do they have only legs? You know, and I was like, that's a brilliant question. Why didn't anyone think of that? Right? So yes, this is, that is meditation. And what was the second part of that question? It was, uh, it was really, is it about extending the, 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 the mindset of being present to parenting or is it you know something broader than that so the first question is yes i think it's that presence the second half of that question to me is it's also action and sometimes action is inaction you know this being present can feel like when i found that a lot of parents when they're with their children have the constant need to instruct you know they're always telling them what to do and how to do it and they think of it as a solid sense of bonding, a solid sense of being there, of protection, and they feel present. They feel like they're doing something. And yoga is about being, human being, you know, like humans are about being. Can we just be? Can we watch them? Can we allow them to lead us, right? So that action 
can turn to inaction and that inaction can be so good to raising your children's self-confidence. Today, the world's children have the highest number of mental health issues. I know so many children who've gone all the way up to, you know, Harvard, MIT, and then I find that, you know, anxiety and mental health issues literally stop them from being the best version of themselves because there's so much pressure in their head. There's so much instruction. They're so used to, you know, mom saying that and dad saying that, that when they go to the workplace, they don't have the resource to, to cope for themselves. So try and stay present and in your actions, in everything that you do for your children, try and be mindful. You know, I think that is the key. There is an element of action always in yoga, but it's supposed to be about being mindful, being conscious. So use your actions kindly. And the way that I use actions is something so simple. Like you go to a restaurant, you order with someone, and how how do you speak to that someone? How do you speak to the to, to the to the gentleman who's serving you? How do you speak to the lady at the petrol station? Right? Your child is watching. Your child is subconsciously picking it up. And you can tell them, say thank you, you know, uh, uh, tidy up at the dining table. You can say a million things to them, but they're going to do what you do. So if you say thank you and you are polite to the lady across the counter, your children are going to be that too. So it's in your action rather than in, you know, in, 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 in words, so to speak. I, I really like what you said earlier about you know, inaction is, is also an action that you may not be used to. And, and that parent you were describing, that's always telling the kids what to do. That's, that's, that's me. That, that's always me. And I'm always chasing my kids, telling them what they should do. And, and I remember taking your, your soul Kappa seminar class last, last year in the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, it made me kind of realize that I'm, I'm getting my kids to, uh, to force themselves to operate within how I perceive the world should operate, right, within my own rules. And um, so after that class, I've been a little more mindful about uh, you know, where did where did this this structure, these rules that I'm asking my kids to to follow come from? And you know, I have no idea. They were they were passed down to me from from friends, from my parents. Uh, a lot of them may not be valid any longer today. And uh, training myself to not do anything is uh, is a lot harder than <laughs> than one might imagine. Like not doing anything and watching your kids uh, do something you would react negatively to uh, is, is certainly a skill that needs to be developed. So I've been, uh, I've been uh, failing at it most, mostly, but I am conscious about doing it when I have done it. I do want to acknowledge some, uh, some, some comments from, from the audience. Ishwar says, I agree with you 100%. Uh, we have to listen to the feelings of our children and people have misinterpreted the word disciplining. Do you have anything to, uh, to say about that? And she goes on to say, we are responsible for our failures, listening to your inner, listening to the inner needs of your children is, is what you're saying. Do you, do you resonate with that? Let me first start off with saying that you are a yoga parent in Amda. It's a very, very brave thing to acknowledge what we are not doing and to be aware of what we are doing and to say, you know what? I'm in this space. So I'm holding this space for every single parent here because I know how difficult parenting is. You know, we feel judged all the time. People are constantly giving you advice, like from the time you're pregnant for a woman, what you should eat, how much you should do, what, you know, what, what works, what doesn't. And then when, once the child comes out, literally the woman is like a receptacle. All attention is focused on the child and, the, and everyone expects, you know, the parents only to focus on the child. Like the first phone call, how's the baby, right? And, and it's judgment, judgment, judgment. So I'm holding a space for everyone, including you, and saying, well done for listening. Well done for saying what you said, because I know it's really, really brave. It takes a lot of courage to say, I did that. I'm trying to do this. And it's sort of working, but it isn't. I can see the rewards, but I'm still a work in progress. And I am too. So I can totally empathize. But what I want to say to every single person listening is offer yourself a lot of kindness when you do this. It doesn't matter if you fail, but empathy matters. When you give yourself empathy at trying something, 
this is something that I tell my children all the time. It doesn't matter if we fail, it's the practice. It's constantly coming back. You know, it's about persevering. It's about constantly coming back. It's like when that toddler starts to crawl, right? We're not telling them how to crawl, but they did it themselves and they're doing it constantly. They keep falling, they get their motor neuro reflexes wrong and they, they keep trying again and again and again. And it's that child who does it in a natural way. For those of us, you know, for those children who, you know, had the developmental milestones, whatever that is, to have met naturally, right? So I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And coming back to Ishwar's question, yes, I do think that discipline has been misunderstood. I feel like discipline is necessary. I, you know, it's definitely something that your child feels safe around. It's a boundary though. It's not a wall. And that boundary has to be set with a lot of love and consistency. What happens with discipline is my child says, oh, you know what, let's go to the park, right? In, when I'm in a great mood and I'm not stressed at work, I'm like, yes, yes, let's go and we go have a great time. But the same child at the exact same time, the next day asked to go to the park. I'm like, what are you talking about going to the park all the time? We, always, we just went to the park yesterday and just, you know, you're shouting down at them, you're talking down to them, right? And, you're, and then the child is confused. Like yesterday you said it was okay to the, go to the park. Why not today? We're not consistent. Discipline is something that we have to enforce through our own behavior. Discipline is something that we say, we give the boundary and we stick to that boundary and it helps others stick to it as well. I think that is the key difference. And, this, and boundaries are about actually building bridges. It's not about building walls. Boundaries is when you tell your child, do this and you expect that that happens. That means you're not according them the same human rights as any other adult. We don't talk to a friend like that. We wouldn't talk to a colleague like that. We wouldn't talk to our partners like that. Why do we talk to our children like that? Like they don't have rights, right? So boundaries are necessary because children are small. They need safety. They need physical safety. They need emotional boundaries. A child who grows up without any boundaries does not know their limits and gets hurt emotionally and physically. So it's about establishing that. I'll give you a really simple example. It's about, so at mealtimes, most parents I know struggle with mealtimes. It's a constant battle between nutrition and you know what the child should eat, what is on the table. And the narrative is usually they come and they're like, yuck, that's horrible and that's yucky. I'm not gonna eat it, right? Hold the space of love, hold that boundary where you say, you can eat this at this particular time and how much ever you eat is yours, but this is all you're going to get. And you give them one safe food that they like, which is healthy, right? But that boundary is maintained every single meal time. You don't keep changing the goalposts to suit your needs on a good day and a bad day and expect that the child is disciplined because that is not discipline. That means you are not disciplined and you're trying to get your child to be disciplined. How can we have those double standards? Very good. Yeah, that, that makes a lot. It's it, I view it as a um, more than a wall. It seems more like a like a stretchy rubber band, if you will, allowing them to to stretch and you being okay with the stretching, and at some point injecting when they get into an unsafe space. The drawing. I think I think what what. Uh, uh, parents will constantly, at least I constantly struggle with is where is that boundary, right? The boundary between self-exploration, not imposing certain, certain, certain restrictions or ideas, but uh, allowing them to be in a safe and healthy and nurturing space. And, and as you said, that, that boundary changes you know, for me, depending on how I'm feeling, because I'm reacting as well. And, and something could be, could appear as a threat when it couldn't be based on how stressed I am. And uh, I always found I vacillate quite a bit on a daily basis with that. And uh, that is true. It confuses the kids quite a bit because as someone pointed out, parents, parents are the role models and, um, and children follow what they see and what you do, which is, which is exactly true. They are great imitators of parents and you know, that's, that's their learning model, right? And you know, maybe can you share some examples or a story of how um, yoga parenting has helped some of your clients 
from where they were and, and what changes they've seen, what benefits they've experienced since, since practicing yoga parenting? Sure. So I actually got a text message uh, from a client about a few days ago around 11 o'clock at night. And, um, and it's something so simple and subtle, just like this boundary thing, right? People always say, oh yes, pet, children do what their parents, like this quote, like they do what they, what we do and not what they say, but to actually practice it is a whole other story. So it's very, very subtle. And I think that, so I got this message and the story goes like this. She said, you know, my daughter was having a really, really bad day. And I was so stressed out at work that I just couldn't take the time. It was the middle of the pandemic, you know, and the Zoom calls were back to back. And she was crying. Like she had this huge temper tantrum, which went on for 45 minutes. And I did all the usual things. I gave her all the ultimatums. I blackmailed her. I bribed her. I did anything. I shouted at her. I did everything short of actually physical abuse to get her to stop, right? And she said, and once all those options were done with, I remembered what you said and I reached out to her and hugged her. She said, you know, and she calmed down within minutes, 45 minutes, which I know in a parent's lifetime when your child is crying for 45 minutes in the middle of a temper tantrum can feel like lifetimes, right? So she reached out to her and hugged her and she said it was the most counterintuitive thing for me to do because I was raised with strict disciplinarian parents and crying would not lead to empathy, it would not give compassion. And in the session together, I said, because she was talking about how her child regularly has temper tantrums. And I said, have you ever tried hugging her, cuddling her, reaching out to her and offering her comfort? She said, no, because I don't want to enable the behavior. I said, okay, what would you like to have done to you when you are crying? What would you like to have done to you when you are stressed and you don't have so children's frontal cortex is not developed. In fact, it's not even developed till like 18, right? To express certain emotions. So they just melt down. And it's not about positive reinforcement when they melt down and you screaming at them saying, shut up, you know? It's actually about offering empathy because the minute you start doing that, the cortisol levels drop in their bodies and they feel safe and secure and they can respond from a more rational space. They're not trying to be anything. They're not trying to manipulate you. They're not trying to get their way. They're not trying to be difficult. Nobody likes crying and yelling and nobody likes feeling stressed. You know, and the, the funny thing is the child is the last person to want to feel like that. Because if you see, the minute the temper tantrum goes down, they're back to their usual joyous selves. Adults take a much longer time to revert back to their happy selves. Children will just switch like that the minute they're okay. And then adults think, oh, there was no residue of me yelling. Of course there was a residue. It's just that they, are, they can bounce back to their natural state much faster, right? Because they're less conditioned. So I think that this example is very telling of being present, being mindful of what my child needs. Another example I can give you is of this friend of mine who was um, having a, a baby about eight months and we were chatting and we actually did a formal session, you know, she reached out and said, let's do a session. She's having a lot of anxiety with the pregnancy and I won't get the details of that, but we did a sort of a communication pattern establishment to explain to her son about how to, you know, welcome the new sibling. And I think that has made a huge difference in how they've talked about, you know, because people talk about, oh, you're going to get this baby and, you know, life is going to change and blah, blah, blah. But when the, old, when the sibling that's already there knows exactly how the mom's time is going to be spent, like physical things that are going to happen, like the baby is going to start crying and I need to feed the baby and I won't be available. So if both of you are crying at the same time, it's very likely I'll have to pick up the baby first because the baby doesn't know how to speak. The baby might be upset. The baby can't express themselves. So I'm gonna choose the baby over you. And I hope that you don't mind because you know, this is the, just the way it is. And you understand, right? Because this baby can't talk immediately, your child becomes your partner and the sibling doesn't become a rival, right? So these are just little ways that clients have sort of benefited from being a yoga parent. How, how long do you, have you found it typically takes 
for, for a parent to see the benefits after they start practicing this mindset of parenting. The next day, when well, another, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the next moment you, is if you implement stuff, right? If you say, I'm having this pain point, I'm having this issue and you implement it, you can see the results immediately. And that's what keeps them coming back for more. The minute they see that, wow, that really worked for my kid. And that worked for me because I feel so much better. I feel like a great parent. And, and then they just would be like, oh yeah, that issue too, and this issue too. And I, that's why I keep saying it's such a personal thing to parent and to be aware uh, that you feel really judged and you hold yourself. The inner critic is very high when you're a parent, right? You're already guilty of so many things. You're already judging yourself for so many things. So to come and speak about a very personal, sensitive part of you is difficult. And I always congratulate people and I hold them with a lot of empathy. And I say, listen, you're doing a fantastic job, first of all, because your intentions for your children are always right. We're not talking about your intention here. We're talking about how you can make things just a little better. So it's not about always being this perfect parent that never gets upset or never loses, loses your temper or never yells at your kids. It's, it's, about, it's about being a little better being a little little more mindful of, of, of how you exist with your kids. Yeah, well, if there's a perfect human, then you find me a perfect parent, right? <laughs> no, I, I think it's about accepting the mess. It's yeah. about being like, I am going to have my meltdown moments and so is my child. They're entitled to theirs. I'm entitled to mine. I can go through really, really difficult, stressed moments. I can, you know, some people are sick. Some people are sick for months together at a time and they're parent from their bed, right? Are they supposed to feel guilty about that? Or can they just enjoy that moment? Be like, listen, I'm, I'm doing my best, mm -hmm. right? Some, I know, I know a mom who actually gave birth to someone discovered she had cancer while she had the baby and was dealing with chemotherapy, radiation after the child is born. Now, is that a mess? Yes, I think so. But, and is she the perfect parent for her daughter? Yes. It's a loud and clear yes. Hmm. I think that we are, there's no perfect, there's no perfection in life. It's about just the stimuli is coming and we accept whatever is coming in our life and we're with that emotion. But the more important thing is to say, I'm scared, I'm confused, I don't know. Um, I am afraid of that dog too. I understand what you are going through. These are all really good things to tell your children. I'm sad, I'm happy. That makes me feel so good when you hug me. These are things that these languages, this love language that you speak to yourself and express to, you, to your child helps them express their language to you. If you wanna try and be perfect and be like, oh, I don't have any messy moments and I never get sad, then your child will not be okay with their sadness. And that's a real tragedy, right? Why shouldn't your child be okay with all the different emotions? Why shouldn't you be okay? So very often I will have these conversations with my, with these kids. And now my kids are like, you seem stressed. The first thing that most parents be like, I'm not stressed. Ma, are you angry? No, I'm not. I'm not angry. The first thing I'll be like, I'll check in with myself. Sometimes I, I don't even know I'm angry and they know. I'm like, yeah, maybe I am angry. Thank you so much for pointing that out to me, you know? Or you've had a yelling moment and you say, I'm sorry, that was not okay to talk to you like that. I'm going to try harder. You know, before I had kids, my, my dog played that role for me. Every time me and my wife would fight, my dog would get upset and start you know, looking at us and whining. And then we would go, okay, I guess, I guess we got to do something different. And our kids do that because you know, they, they can pick up on things that uh, when we're lost <laughs> in the heat of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, for folks you know, that, that want to try out yoga parenting, they want to, uh, we talked about this is, this is not a, you know, this is not a, a, uh, a degree you have to get to get trained in uh, for many number of years. It's, it's, a, it's a change in, in how you see yourself and how you approach parenting. What, what are some quick things that folks can go back uh, you know, tonight or you know, today, depending on where you are, and apply with the kids? It's you know, just routine things while brushing or eating, tucking them in. Is there anything, any tool that they can use? Just you know, get a flavor of what, what is life as a yoga parent look like? 
I'm so glad you asked me that. Okay. So the first thing right after the yoga nidra session, after you wake up in complete bliss, after Stephanie will guide you through that. I want you to watch your children, watch your grandchildren, watch your nieces, nephews, whatever child in your life, watch them with wonder because they are really alien to us, you know, and we have so much to learn from them. Watch the way they look at why the napkin hook is curved in a certain way and where it fits, you know, watch the way they want to pull out everything because they're curious about why this works in a certain way. Watch them with wonder, the number one thing. Two, start to treat them as human beings, not instruction manuals that, you know, of your liking, your conditioning. Start to treat them as people with opinions, people with feelings. They hear you when you say, oh, she's such a pain. He's such a bad eater. He's getting on my nerves. They hear you. They have feelings. They pretend like they didn't, just like you hurt your parents. And that hurt you. They don't have a choice, right? They have no other home to go to. So they will stick to your home. They have no other choices. You are their safety net. If you abuse them, if you treat them badly, if you're unkind to them, they will still come back to you for hugs and kisses. They've got nowhere else to go. So don't... Don't be like, oh, they, they're fine. Don't try and brush that aside. Try and be like, how can I treat them with the highest amount of respect that they deserve and I deserve? The minute you start treating them with that mutual sense of respect, you'll get that respect back. And that's a joyful way to parent. Watch them with wonder, give them lots of respect. Talk to them, three, talk to them like they have feelings, be around them like they have feelings. And four, acknowledge yourself to have those feelings. Acknowledge the human in you. There's no perfection in this and allow them to have that too. And five, I think a really good way to parent is, is this making me happy? Is this making me more joyful? A lot of the chores that we do, a lot of the caring that we do gets so exhausting, gets so tiring because we're constantly moving from one thing to another to another because we're so agenda driven. But when we're in the moment with the child, it stops being exhausting. The chores don't feel endless because we're in a st state of participation, we're in a state of enjoyment. So coming back to the question, is this giving me joy? Or is this just by like, get out of your clothes, change into this, get on to dinner, finish, tick, 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 tick. So agenda-based and they become agenda-based and then the cycle of life continues like that, you mm -hmm. know? So I, yeah, I think, yeah. Five little I things just, to start off with, pick one. On that same thread, you know, a lot of parents deal with, uh, uh, say, guilt, well, uh, with, you know, especially if you don't have enough time, you're constantly working, not being, you know, not being able to spend enough time with your kids and a quality time. Um, where does yoga parenting fit into that? How, how does it have your, have you dealt with clients that, that you know, do feel guilty about not spending enough time with kids and uh, can yoga parenting help with that? I think that guilt is the number one emotion that parents feel. Even stay-at-home moms feel like they're not doing enough. You know, mm -hmm. it's not even just a working professional. They're constantly like, I could have done that better. I could do this better. I yelled at my child then and, oh, this was such a pain. And I tell people, the minute you let go of the guilt and come from the space of, I am doing my best and really believe that in your heart and have faith in that, everything shifts for you. I don't know a single parent who doesn't try their best for their children. You know, I know that they're coming from a space of, you know, of pure intention of wanting the best for their child. I think that that trust has to be there. And normally every session that we do with yoga parents starts with these very affirmations of you are already doing a good job. So let go of the guilt. Even if you have half an hour that you're spending with your child, and if that's what your circumstances allow, so be it. You know, I'm t I've just told you stories about people who are sick and ill and still parenting. How are they supposed to feel, right? What if you have a job that's very, very demanding, you can only spend half an hour, but that half an hour, make it count. Take away the screen, spend time being respectful, loving to your child, watching your child with wonder, and things will move for you. That sense of spaciousness will enter your body and time will stop still for your child and you, and that half an hour will be worth it. But Spending that half an hour feeling guilty about, oh my God, I didn't do a good enough job and my, I should be giving more is a waste of time for both you and your child. So 
every minute that you get try and be mindful with that and let go of the guilt and the way in yoga that we always talk about how you can't let go of something without creating a new pattern it's not easy oh just let go of the guilt replace the guilt with faith that you have the best of intentions for your child so this is guilt this is faith have faith you know in yourself trust yourself you're doing your best for your child believe in that and you'll fall you'll see that the guilt goes away okay that sounds wonderful <laughs> All right, we have maybe a minute left. Let me just check if we have any questions. Lots of great comments, people resonating with what you're saying. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any specific questions. Okay, no questions. Last, uh, last question from me to leave, uh, to leave the audience for, especially for those with short attention spans like myself that always forget most of what they are. Uh, what's, what's the one thing you want people to remember from in the last, how long have we been talking? 45 minutes. There's one thing you could, you, you could distill all of this down to one thing for people to remember as they leave here, you know, what, what would it be? Have compassion for yourself as a parent and treat your child with the same compassion and respect and feelings that you have. Okay, compassion for yourself and your kid. And as, as somebody said, uh, watch them as a spectator. I really like that. <laughs> yes, yes, witnessing them, being that spectator. And I want to add one last thing. I feel like I, when you are a yoga parent and people are like, what impact does this have on a world, right? Like we're living in this world, we're living in this constant hustle and bustle of life. I'd like to add that as a yoga parent, you are contributing to a generation of aware, mindful individuals who grew up secure and confident in themselves. And you are helping raise a whole new era of people who vote for the right candidates, who vote towards openness, who are, you know, agents of change towards a more open society, to, you know, who resonate with forests, who talk about saving water. Like it, it boils down to the most basic things about who we are as human beings when we parent them well you're leading them away from addiction, you're leading them away from all the uh, disorders, mental health, as well as physical health, right? Obesity is one of the greatest uh, indicators of our time. So forget all the bad stuff, which is not going to happen, but a lot of good stuff happens. Imagine living in a world 20 years from now where our children are in charge and they make all the right changes and all the right decisions to make this world a better place. I think that has to be the single most like greatest motivation for us, right? As to why we have to be compassionate to them and respectful for them and understand them as humans. So yoga parent doesn't just help you, it's driving sustainable change in, in future generations. That's right. Okay, wonderful. So we're out of time. Uh, if, if folks wanna learn more about yoga parenting, dive deeper, how, how can they get in touch with you? Do you have a website or a course they can take? Yes, there, we have plenty of courses coming up. You can follow us on Instagram at Solkatha, S-O-U-L-K-A-T-H-A. Um, you can get in touch with me at karishma at solkatha.com. I can put that um, on the chat later. Um, yes, and at the TGIF folks, you know, we've done gratitude series. We've done a lot of work together so they can get, you know, put you in touch with me. We're actually collaborating with lots of different people and we have courses, we have our own courses, but we all, and I do a lot of personal coaching sessions as well to, for people to have a deep dive into this and be guided. So yes, we, it's an open space of learning and curiosity, which is held in empathy. So yes, I love to hear from a lot of you. Okay, great. So everyone, I hope you caught how to get in touch with Karishma and you'll, you'll post your link in, uh, uh, or your handle in the chat window then, so people can track you down. Okay, I'm not, I don't think I have access to everyone, but can you put it, do you have access to everyone? I can type in, what is, is it? Yeah, Karishma at, yeah. At okay. Karishma at solkata.com. All right, I'm gonna send this to everybody. Okay, well, thanks Karish, it was great chatting. And uh, I'll turn it back to TGIF. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to talk to you, Inanda. For everyone who's watching, he's one of my best friends and I can't believe he's a yoga parent and we're on this journey, like life keeps aligning us together. And it's so, so happy, so grateful. 
Thanks, Karish. Bye. Stephanie, welcome. Hi, thank you, Karishma. I was just catching the end of your session. It was lovely. Thank you so much. For everyone who is joining us, we are in the Yoga in Canada Summit. The Great India Festival and Solkata have come together to bring to you speakers from around the world who have dedicated their life to understanding yoga, to understanding the breath, the light, the magic of yoga beyond just asana. Asana is good, but so is meditation, pranayama, visualization, yoga nidra, chair yoga, parenting, chanting, meditation. And this is just a little sliver of yoga. You know, there's so much more to that. And I hope that all of you like whet your appetites and now, you know, try to figure out what, where your mojo is at with yoga. So you can find your unique healing technique, your little, you know, where that puzzle just fits for you. I hope you find that. Um, Stephanie is joining us from San Francisco. Um, she has been practicing yoga nidra for the last 25 years. She is a psychotherapist, a yoga therapist, and a healer. She's traveled across the world conducting workshops on yoga nidra. And, and for me, Stephanie is, is just this beautiful connection because we share the same teacher. We both studied with Richard Miller. Um, in I studied with him in Australia. Stephanie has spent most of her life learning from him and contributing to the very institution, to iRest, which is, iRest is amazing. iRest works in neighborhoods across America where uh, drug rates, crime rates are at the highest. They work in schools where children are addicted to drugs. Um, they work with the US military with PTSD, but also to prepare them into war. The number of things that I know that Yoga Nidra has helped people with is astounding. But for me personally, it has helped. And when Stephanie and I connected, the resonance in her voice was very much like Richard's. And that's, the, that's why I think the journey went moved forward because we felt like we'd suddenly met and we started talking and we said, oh, we were in the same room in Sydney. I came for that seminar. I was there for that workshop. And I was like, so was I. <laughs> you know, so. Um, and, and I think this is how people connect and this is how you will form connections of your own going forward, being like, I resonated with that person, that vibration felt right, this feels good to me. <laughs> so find your medicine, you know, everyone says find your poison, I say find your medicine, because here Stephanie is bringing us to the very end of this beautiful summit. Um, and first I'm going to ask Stephanie to give you instructions of how to do the yoga nidra. Uh, after which, while you settle yourselves down, we'll, we'll chat a little bit and, you know, talk about yoga nidra. And then I'm going to share instructions right now. We're going to end this summit on a silent note. So all the thank yous, everything will be done before. You will be sent off into a spa space of yoga and bliss. And that's how we want to end this. So there will be no thank you. There will be nothing after Stephanie's words are spoken, we will all leave silently uh, and hold that space for us on this day of International Yoga that we continue on the spirit and the path of yoga in whichever way that we seek. Stephanie, if you could uh, just guide us through the instructions, that would be great. Oh, sure. Well, the instructions are easy. Uh, just please make yourself comfortable. So traditionally, yoga nidra is uh, done lying down. So build yourself a nest, make yourself, you know, grab some pillows, blankets. Um, you know, if you're lying down, you could put some blankets underneath your knees to release your low back, something under your head. Uh, you could do this seated as well. And so just you know, get anything that would make you incredibly comfortable because as I'm offering the yoga practice, really all you need to do is, is rest and you can listen to my words and it's follow along with what arises for you. It should be a practice where you're meeting what's most calling your attention 
and many people might fall asleep and that's absolutely okay. You'll still be gaining access from the benefits of the meditation because uh, what I'm uh, supporting you to access and what I'm you know, teaching to help you to, to open into is to your most essential nature, is this ineffable mystery that's giving rise to each of us. And it's here, um, it's all pervasive, no matter the states of consciousness. So make yourselves really comfortable. That's, that's my easy instructions. <laughs> awesome. So those of you who want to lie down, start finding your spot now. And yeah, and just, yeah, like Stephanie says, just find the spaces in your body that need to rest more and and then be guided by her words let her words resonate through your being um while we tell you more about what this is about what is yoga nidra stephanie well i'll tell you i mean it's an ancient practice it's as ancient as the practices of of yoga itself it, you know it can go back all the way to the upanishads um, you know, it, it's been spoken about in Sankhya philosophy, you know, it's, it's thousand year old practice, if not longer orally. And really it's, it's a practice of deep meditation where Nidra, as, as you may know, is, is to sleep in Sanskrit. That can be its definition and yoga while it's traditionally yoke or union, really I'm approaching yoga as, as that interconnected wholeness that we can access within ourself or with the world around us. This ineffable mystery, as I was saying, that gives rise to each of us. So what we're doing is we're opening up into that pure consciousness. Um, we'll talk about that as Turiya in yoga is the fourth state. So we have four different states of consciousness. Well, more than that, but um, we'll just talk about the four. And uh, so we have the awake consciousness, then we have the dreaming um, and then dreamless sleep. And so what we're accessing, it's a paradox. It's, it's known as sleep of the yogi, but it's, it's really when we know and experience ourselves as this ineffable mystery, this awake awareness, this interconnected wholeness that's ever present, no matter the changing states of consciousness. So it can be a full path of awakening where we awaken to our true nature and we recognize there's something about us that's that's always been healed, that's always whole, that's untouched by stress and the changes in life. And we have the capacity to have a direct firsthand experience of that. Wow. I just love your languaging. Healed self, completely healed whole self, integrated, you know, self, which is already present. And we're just trying to access what's already there. So. It is true that yoga nidra can access your subconscious? Sure, but we're accessing something even deeper because we're accessing that part of us in which all aspects of the mind is arising. But yes, absolutely. So people will say like, or we'll joke around and say, if you hear someone snoring, check it out, it might be you. And people chuckle and that's really funny. And then I was teaching a workshop once and there was a, a young man who was in college and it was his first time meditating, first time with yoga nidra. And I said that to the group, everybody laughed. And he came up, he raised his hand actually afterwards. He's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I heard someone snoring and it was me. <laughs> he was so excited because he realized that his body was asleep. But yet yeah. there was this part of him that was completely alert, awake and aware, but it wasn't going to, it wasn't the conscious mind of like right now, he was starting to access this, this essential nature that's always online. So yeah, we can, and we access something quite deep. That's beautiful. But we access it through the body. We access it through the breath, like. Yes, yes. It's a somatic based meditation. So in this practice, we're going through the koshas, which are the different sheaths or layers of the body that uh, we take ourselves to be, but these are just layers and our essential nature is, is underlying and, and pervading each of those layers. And so in order to access that, we, we access through the body. So everything that I'm offering, I'll be offering you to have as a felt sense in your body. 
And that includes the movement of energy. So you have Anamaya, which is the body-based aspect, Pranamaya, which where we're opening up to the energy body, Manamaya, which we're accessing emotions, Vijnanamaya, of course, is the wisdom body, and that might be perceptions. Um, Anandamaya, which is that bliss and delight and wonder that you were talking about so beautifully. And then we also weave in as Mita Maya, which is really just taking a look at this idea of being a separate I thought and how that too is just another thought. And there's something else here that is aware of even that. Wow. So the way that you describe this feels like this unending sense of bliss, right? But as human beings, we're sort of messy, you wake up from the nidra and then what happens, right? <laughs> like, is it this, wow, I'm in this state of bliss because I've done yoga nidra, I've read the books, I've done the series and sometimes it shakes me up, it shakes up my insides, right? And I wake up as a different human and so it takes me days sometimes to shake off that experience and it's probably not pleasant. So, you know, to talk about this constantly positive thing and this healing thing, some, it could be a misnomer for some people watching because it can also have um, a different result, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm not, I'm not going to take us into like the, the depths of our deepest emotions today, but you're absolutely right. We, when, we're, when we're opening into this practice, it can pull out of our subconscious anything. And when we're opening into meditation and the depth of meditation, that's what happens. We're opening Pandora's box. So everything that's in our unconscious or our subconscious eventually comes to the surface. And what's so important about having a body-based practice, and we start with within Sankalpa, which is the first movement of any yoga nidra practice, no matter what lineage or post-lineage that you're, that you're studying from, because there are many different expressions of yoga nidra. I rest just happens to be one. But in Sankalpa, that's our heartfelt intention or our heartfelt desire. And what we, uh, what we started to offer here is, is something called an inner resource, which is just that deep sense of well-being, okayness, a sense of security and peace. So I'll offer that at the very beginning so that you can feel that as a somatic sense, even if we use our imagination to come up with a place that we feel really at peace and at ease, we wanna make sure that we anchor it in the body so that then if stressors come up in life, then we can use even just that part of a yoga nidra, even as in our everyday life so that we can start to really feel that part of us that's deeply okay, that's deeply at peace. And it helps us to navigate, balance our nervous system and navigate what might come up and be quite stressful, that would be normal. Um, but we're, we're learning to meet that also from, from a part of us that's deeply okay. That is so beautifully put, Stephanie. It actually resonates a lot with what Raghu said this morning mm -hmm. in the sessions with how the pain and the stimuli doesn't go away, but yoga helps us cope with what life has to offer and it reduces the stress levels so the biochemical reactions in our body are, are more relaxed to cope with life circumstances. We can't stop, you know, the accidents, we can't stop grief, we can't stop the loss of loved ones, we can't stop our inner turmoil, the questions that come through, the conflict within us, but we can have resources to cope with them better. I think that's exactly what you're saying here is mm -hmm. I'll give you that resource, right? I understand today is a beginner's yoga nidra practice because a lot of people have probably never ever tried it. And so it'll be a very gentle, it'll hold them in a lot of light and you know they can find that felt resource. But as they go deeper into that and they unpack that, you'll continue to offer them that anchor within them. Mm -hmm. of, yes. Of yes. saying, yes, it's possible that you could feel good and that resource is within you. That divinity is within you and you can keep going back to that. Um, you know, it sounds crazy to so many people that someone can dedicate their entire life. I mean, people dedicate their entire life to yoga and people already think they're crazy, but you've dedicated your entire life to yoga nidra, which is like, you know, tunnel deep into one form of healing. What motivates you to do that? 
I, gosh, I mean, we all have our own transformational experiences with whatever, well, at least I have had a transformational experience. I think many of us that are dedicated to the path of yoga um, have had that transformation in our life. And that's what happened to me. I'd, I'd had glimpses of, I'd say, this underlying essence, this ineffable mystery as, as a little girl. I think we all have these you know, aspects that we can tap into. And my first yoga nidra class, I dropped in with a teacher in Chicago, Illinois. Um, his name is Para Rez, and he's an amazing yoga teacher and yoga therapist. And I just dropped in and I didn't, I felt no sense of separation. I felt myself interconnected literally with everything. And I, I, I couldn't leave the yoga studio. He was so sweet. He gave me an apple and talked to me and helped me to reground, but it was, a, it was familiar. It was something that I knew was incredibly important and I wanted more of it. And then the more that I got to experience it, I'm somebody who lived with a great deal of anxiety. I started to start to cope with anxiety in a whole different way. Um, it just transformed my life. I became much more balanced, much more at ease and started to tap into something that I, that was I could rely on no matter what was happening. And then as a therapist, I'm a clinical social worker and a gestalt trained therapist. It was just so healing for my clients. And then of course I was a yoga teacher and a yoga therapist. So I was using it that way too. And it's just so transformational. It's just, I don't know, this is my Dharma. We all just somehow find what we're meant to be doing. And it's what life, I just, my heart just keeps saying yes to. <laughs> it's a gift and a joy. So you found that experience and you found yourself feeling one, that non-dualness, one with the universe. Mm -hmm. And then you said, I want more. And you served others with this. And you felt that was constantly filling you up. And, and that continues to keep you fulfilled and in service of this practice. We all have the capacity this is this is this is our this is our birthright. This is our true nature. So it's not something mysterious. It's only out there for you know this chosen. Th I mean, we each can have a taste of this if 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 nothing else. And once we do, it, we never. It's like you can't shut your eyes again. <laughs> you know. This is it, Stephanie. If anything has been ever said, and this is a single line summary of this entire summit, I think this is it. We all have it inside of us. Yeah. You've said it, you know, you hit the nail on the head. We all have it inside of us. It's not something mysterious. It's not something that's out there. It's inside of us, the yoga that we're looking for, the peace, the calm, the meditation, the bliss, right? That we want to experience with all the other stuff is inside of us. There is no outer and it goes beyond, you know, race and gifts and uh, you know, someone who's spending a lot of time trying to um, unlock this intellectually or in emotionally or whatever. I think it's about just intending to stay on the path and constantly going back to the practice and saying, yes, I believe this is inside of me. And it's not something esoteric and imaginary and magical. Right? The magic is inside me. Yeah, it's a practice really of self-inquiry of what's true for you. I mean, isn't it? I mean, that's all any aspect of yoga. There are all these beautiful, exquisite experiments that we get to see. And there are these masters that came before us that laid down this pathless path, really. And then we all get to see, well, well what's true here now? What, you know, and uh, so don't take don't take my word for it. Check it out. See what's true for you. All right. I think everyone's sort of ready. If anyone has any questions, this is the moment. Um, we're going to, I'm going to wrap up and leave the floor open to Stephanie totally to lead you into the non-dual, non-separated, whole, integrated part of you that you can find inside of yourself. Um, for those of you who are joining us at this last session, um, I want to say there's a lot of, uh, we've done a lot today. We've spoken about a lot today. I'd like you to tune in to the YouTube channels to figure out what meets your mojo, what yoga works for you to broaden your understanding of what yoga really is. And I'm here to thank every single one of you 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for showing up for yourselves, for being brave enough to embrace the alien parts of you, for the scared parts of you, the loving parts of you that wanted to change something about yourself. That's the reason you're here. And I hope you've got a sweet taste of that. Um, I really, really want to thank Bala Uncle, a huge shout out, because um, I think that you are the cornerstone of the Great India Festival, of the yoga in Canada Summit. It's your perseverance, your interest, your passion for serving that has led to this. Rupa has been an absolute rock in making this happen, right down to designing like the posters, detailing, and you know, she's pretty much everywhere all the time, making sure everything's on the ball. This could not have happened without you. So a huge shout out. We won't do any applause, but we can have it in our hearts. We can say thank you to TGIF, to Yoga in Canada for allowing this to happen. And for every single speaker and panelist who's come here to share their story, to share their skills, to share their tools and techniques so that you can have a better life. Um, so thank you all for being here. I am so very grateful for having the honor of, of meeting and re-meeting so many of you, of having conversations that en enlighten my life, that I take back into my practice so I can become a better human being. And I'm really, really grateful for that and humbled by this experience. Um, and thank you so much, Stephanie. I am going to get lost in your words in three seconds exactly. <laughs> So I'm going to tune out. Thank you, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yes, I, Stephanie, guide us, lead us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Karishma. And thank you to the great India Festival and Yoga in Canada as well. It's just an honor to be here and to be offering this yoga nidra meditation for you all and thank you to everyone who stayed um, for this part of the of the festival of today and this honor of gosh we're both at summer solstice at least here in the northern hemisphere as well as this international day of yoga and i can't think of a better place a better way to celebrate so thank you again so i'll be offering about a 20 minute meditation so please make yourselves comfortable you can do this practice with eyes open or eyes closed, whatever is most comfortable and accessible for you. So we'll just take a moment for this time of transition. Just acknowledging all that's been shared, all that you've been listening to and participating with, all of these amazing speakers, thoughts that are coming and going that's led you here to this moment right now. Knowing that for the next 20 minutes or so, there's nothing else you need to do, nothing you need to know. Just coming into a moment of deep, deep rest. You might let the body settle even more fully into the support of the surface underneath it. Seeing if there's any last minute adjustments that would allow your body to come into a greater sense of ease and relaxation. And then welcome in the space of the room around you. How it's here, supporting you. You might open the senses, notice sounds that are coming and going. But nothing that you need to grasp onto or reach out towards? Can you just simply feel yourself open and receptive? Sound coming to you. You might even be before your mind labeled sound, just the pure vibration of it. Be 
the inner eyes open to seeing, even if it's just little specks of light behind the eyelids or the darkness from having closed eyes. Mouth open to tasting any residues of taste. And the nose open to smelling. You might feel the whole body now, the whole body alive. Sensing this underlying life force that is animating your body, giving it a sense of vitality, vibration. You might open to your heart's deepest intention for this particular practice. Would you like to just come into a moment of ease? Feel a deep sense of rest. Or maybe touch into a part of you that's always at peace. Whatever your intention, can you place it in the present tense if there are words and feel it as a truth right now? And then welcome in a deep inner resource, a sense of peace, ease. Sense of feeling deeply okay and nourished. If it's helpful, you might imagine a place, a special room or a place in nature where when you're there, you feel deeply at peace. With your mind's eye, you might look around and See, what are all the colors and textures of this place? Is it warm or cool? You might invite in loved ones, wisdom figures, who love and support you unconditionally, just as you are. And see the goodness in you. And notice as you're feeling this sense of ease or well-being or peace, How does it feel in your body? Maybe you have a warmth in the heart or the belly or some other sensation. Do you stay with the felt sense of this even as the images drop away? And how all the while there's just this quality of your very presence, just this ease of being. Whole and complete, just as you are.
And then you might allow my words to be your words as you open into the felt sense of the body and the body breathing. So just opening to sensations inside the mouth, from the floor of the mouth to the soft palate at the roof of your mouth. The center of the tongue, pure sensation. Sense deep inside the jaw. And if you come upon any tension, just feel right into the center of it. Sensation in the ears. All the way out to the outer curves and folds of the earlobes. The skin of the face. The eyes resting deep inside the head. Feel back behind both eyes to a center point inside the head. Crown, back of the head, whole head, pure sensation. And then joining with each inhalation and exhalation just inside the nostrils. Welcoming the inhalation and the exhalation as pure sensation inside the nostrils. Opening to the caress of breath inside the throat. Join with the stream of an exhalation as it flows down through the shoulders, upper arms, elbows, lower arms, palms and fingers. Feeling both arms from shoulders to fingertips. Perhaps a tingling or vibration. On an exhalation, sensing from the fingertips all the way up to the shoulders. And the exhalation, let it open sensation through the whole torso. For several breaths, you might open to sensation in the upper chest, the inner walls of the upper chest, front and back, left and right. Middle chest. Belly and low back. Sense the whole torso like a sphere of sensation. Expanding on the inhalation. Softening on the exhalation. Radiating inwardly and outwardly as pure sensation. Writing the stream of the next exhalation as sensation. Let it 
open from the hips down through the hollows of the thighs, knees, lower legs, feet and toes. Letting go of just looking down with the eyes. Can you feel both legs and feet from within? One feeling. And since the whole body, the whole body, legs, torso, arms, head, perhaps a shimmering of sensation. And just noticing all these changing sensations of body and breath, how they are born, they grow and dissolve within a background sense of your very presence. A witnessing awareness that's always here. Your unchanging presence or the simple ease of being in which all the changing sensations are coming and going. And you might just notice how there may be a particular emotional tone or a thought or a daydream. So can you welcome it? can feel it as sensation and then set it free like a cloud that's passing through the sky. And feel yourself resting more and more as this witnessing awareness. deeply at peace, whole just as it is. So there's nothing to push away. You can join with a flow of inhalation all the way to its fullness. How it reveals a momentary stillness. A flow of an exhalation all the way to its end. dissolves in stillness itself. Our mind may be drawn to this changing sensation or energy, whether it's the breath or a thought. We can unhook attention Set it free and feel yourself dissolving like sugar into water to this 
background presence of stillness itself. As you're resting here, simply being just your very presence, something here that's very timeless, spacious, whole and complete, just as it is. You might spontaneously have a sense of gratitude or love or wonder. Or you might choose to invite this in and welcome in a memory, a loved one, or perhaps someone dear in your heart that you feel a great sense of gratitude or love itself. And it can be here for no reason at all, but just notice how this feels in the body when you touch into it. Might you let it saturate every cell of your body so that every cell is swimming in gratitude itself or love itself. And imagine yourself moving into the rest of your day or evening, putting back on the different layers of your personality and the body and the emotions that come and go. You could even imagine yourself coming into relationships, talking with others, maybe cooking a meal moving into the rest of your day or even this week. And then imagine yourself also taking a moment of pause where you feel back into this background presence or just this ease of being. There's something here, no matter those changing circumstances where you find yourself that's deeply at peace. That's utterly whole just as it is. And how you might feel that both is online at once. Your personality, you keep talking, you keep doing your activity, parenting, working, whatever it is you're doing. Celebrating the fullness of your expression and feeling into this underlying essence, this great field of being that you are. This wholeness that's here, no matter what's happening in life. So take your time. We'll be ending here in just a moment. You have the luxury, you're at home. You don't have to rush out of this yoga nidra practice. You can take all the time you need to come back, to let your body and senses come back online slowly, naturally. Your body knows when it wants to reawaken. And as you do, even as we're transitioning from the formal practice of yoga nidra, this essence that you are, this underlying ground of being, it's always here. It's, it's always online. 
So watch how you don't leave home. Thank you for joining. Thank you for Great India Festival, Yoga in Canada. Thank you for your very presence. What a gift to be together in this way. Blessings, my friends.